Check, check. Okay. Can Hi, you guys. Hear thanks me? for coming out. I don't want to embarrass you. We're going to keep it very relaxed, and there will be time for you to ask questions because I'm sure you'll have a lot of them. And I think any questions related to the Knowles Carters, I'll leave for you to ask. Um, but without embarrassing you, we, we first met through one of the generous collectors um, in the exhibition, A.C. Hudgens. And um, I actually thought this would be like a useful place to start because I was having breakfast and A.C. said to me, you ever heard of Khalil Joseph? And I almost lost my mind because I'm such a fan of Until the Quiet Comes in particular. And then he said, oh, I'm gonna go get him. He's in my basement. I was not expecting that. And um, the first thing you said was, AC, do you have any lotion? Because my arms are ashy. <laughs> but I think this leads to the reason why I'm saying it is not to embarrass you, but because I think there's something about the way that you film black skin. And it's something that recurs in a lot of the works in the show. But that sensibility, I think, is incredibly seductive. And it's also very, just very present. And I was wondering if you wanted to say something about that. We drove right into the craft. Yeah. Um... Well, I collaborate with people, cinematographers specifically, who uh, the works that you've seen, especially that last one, Wildcat, um, he already came with, his name is Malik Sayed, had a super advanced kind of uh, philosophy around how to photograph black folks that I'm a student of, and we're all students in a way of writing. Roy de Crava, who were, you know, uh, and in fact, I think that piece more than any other one, you know. That will help lead us yeah, to where I, we're going later yeah. on tonight. Well, when the introduction happened, um, my colleague Richard was mentioning that you were born in Seattle. Mm -hmm. There's fairly little else known about you between the born in Seattle and, you know, uh, lemonade and doing a work like this commission here tonight. Mm -hmm. So do you want to fill in some of the gaps? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Well, you know, we're the, same, we're the same generation. And, you know, we both kind of, I think a lot of people think about having watched BET or MTV back when they used to actually show music videos mm -hmm. or the box. But one of the questions that I had, since, of course, the first two works that we showed were music videos working with musicians is some of the kind of formative music videos that you may have seen in your uh -huh. youth. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I definitely grew up on MTV and, you know, uh, BET and stuff like that. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, studying, wanting to study film. And I met someone in Hollywood and they, uh, you know, they were connected somehow and they said, you know, who do you want to work for? You know, like uh, if they could help me in any yeah, way. Yeah, like your dream person yeah. to work with. Yeah, and um, I remember he immediately said Spike Lee, you know, arguably because that's one of the few, if only, people he had as a reference. And I remember saying, no, I want to work with Hype Williams. Uh -huh. And he was like, interesting. Uh, but through some contacts, you know, I ended up uh, having a guest pass on one of Hype sets. Which one? Oh, man. <laughs> Macy Gray. OK. I was I using the, the fisheye lens then. I always think of Hype yeah. Williams with the kind of low yeah. camera angles and, you know, He eye. definitely had been pretty far in his career, so you could tell he, everything was kind of dialed in. Um, but I wanted to make music videos, for sure. <gasps> and which led me to Malik Saeed, who eventually I ended up getting to work with, uh, which is super awesome. And, uh, yeah, it went from there. I, I tried to do, like, conventional music videos and no one uh, really allowed me to, you know, do like a proper budget, okay. big, big budget video. So I started doing like $5,000, $10,000 videos. And, uh, so the, the experimentations came out of the parameters of not oh, having yeah. a big budget. Oh, yeah. Okay. And um, just also the freedom, you know, the, there weren't big record labels or the, the artists generally were more creative or hands-on. Yeah. And... Um, it dawned on me pretty early that I was interested in the form of music videos, and I didn't realize that until I started making stuff, you know, um, which kind of led to these unconventional 
you know, using multiple songs and cutting a song up. Like you did in Sampha's yeah. process. Um, so that's a 40 minute piece that you guys can see on iTunes. Yes. Yeah. But that also had a premiere here in London at, um, oh, yeah. at the ICA. ICA. Yeah. So um, that leads to another question. And I know you've answered this one before elsewhere, but it's useful for us to have it in this room. How do you choose who you work with? You know, uh, it's generally bigger than me, you know, so, um, yeah, that's the easiest way to answer it. You know, every, Previously, you've said grace, but, you know, there's yeah, something else that kind of brings yeah, people together. Like even how you and I met. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like, you know, the conversation happened and then, you know, eight weeks later or something, I get an email. Yeah. You know, yeah. So keep the process going. And here we are. So. Um, yeah, just try to listen. You know, if I hear something amazing, I'll inquire, you know, who that person is or if they have, if they're trying to do something. Um, I remember, like, uh, Beyonce as an example, how, you know, if you would have asked me b before I got the call, I would have been very adamant that I, it's not somebody I intended to work with. Just we had different things going on. Right. Um, but then, you know, you have a conversation and that leads to another conversation and that leads to, you know, ideas and circumstances and all of a sudden you're like, I guess I'm doing this thing, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. So that can happen for all of us, maybe. Yeah, um, it's true. It's true. So Hilton Alls um, has described your work as having an emotional eye. And when I was looking back through these films, all of which I'd seen a number of times, I wrote down a single word, and that was resilience. And I think that you're able to find beauty in resilience, um, but in, in lots of different ways. And it's something that I think permeates the three that we've seen, but also other works of yours. Do you? I don't know if you see that as well. Um, yeah, I've never thought of it in those terms. Um, yeah, I'd have to think about that for a second. Okay, well, I'll let you keep thinking. Well, in the first film that we saw, Black Up, um, so it's Shabazz Palaces, and then, of course, um, one of the members before was in um, Diggable Planets. Yeah, right. And then one of the, the refrains in that song is actually in a Diggable Planets song as well. So I remember oh, okay. it from my CD back okay. in the day. You know, black is you, black is me, black is us. Oh, okay. And again, that's something that I feel we need to bring the special guest on. Sorry? Oh, and it's also The Last Poets. So, ah, so there's all these, it's very iterative. Mm. Um, but it's also something that I see in the aesthetic as kind of recurring in the how you represent us oh, as a yeah, people. Totally. I mean, yeah, I'm obsessed with blackness for sure. I mean, it's super interesting to me, you know. Um, especially in America, it's just, uh, it's the diversity of it is astounding. And then um, I grew up, as you said, in Seattle, which, you know, most people, the first thing they say is, you know, there's black people in Seattle. Right. And they're kind of like, yeah, you know, a yeah. lot, there's a lot of us. Um, and Seattle's kind of, it's not an island. I mean, technically it is, but um, it definitely feels isolated from the rest of the country culturally. Mm. Um, like I always remember, like seeing an India, NWA video or something, you know, I was just like, what is, what's right. going on out there? Yeah, none of the, yeah, the references yeah. weren't your references. Yeah, it's not right. what I saw, you know, yeah. when, I, when I you know, went to school or something. So I'll never forget when Wu-Tang hit and some of the kids, you know, either have went to New York or they just had heavily dove into the Wu-Tang kind of, okay. you know, black hole. And so they, they just, bring Staten Island back to Seattle. They would come to the high school just talk, you know, with the wallabies and the, with the lingo. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what the fuck <laughs> is going on out there? Um, <laughs> and so it wasn't until I got like 18, 19, I left Seattle and went to LA. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up in a super uh, creative household, and you know, my brother ended up being a really successful painter, and so we Noah were. Noah Davis. Yeah, yeah. Um, very exposed to black cultural 
phenomenon globally. Um, so I don't know. It, it just was. It's an endless, you know, cornucopia of paradoxes and beauty and crazy frequencies, and energy and personalities. Um, and you, I just never saw that. Right. So when I started, you know, deciding I was going to be a filmmaker, studying, you know, making images, it just was like obvious that nobody else was doing anything right. <laughs> that I, I was excited about, so. Um. Well, if I can speak about one personality, and yeah, certainly kind of frequencies and doing something no one else is doing. Um, Alice Coltrane mm. has an interesting link, not only to the exhibition, but also um, to your work, because of course, Flying Lotus is also known as Stephen Ellison, mm -hmm. is Alice Coltrane's nephew. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you come to work with? Um, I remember a friend of mine playing one of me, me one of his CDs um, in LA when I was in college, and I just thought it was the most amazing. You know, we all have, kind of have these moments with different artists, and this kind of they hit, they connect with them at a certain point in time, and that was my experience. And so he, for me, was that's the guy I really want to do a project with or a video for. And I remember contacting him because at the time he was local and he also wasn't that famous. Yeah. He's far bigger than he is now than he was. And um, I remember going over his studio and, you know, showing him whatever I had at the time, which was nothing. And he kind of was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, maybe later kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, and so cut to four years later, I had made project for Shabazz Palaces, which is the first thing you saw. Black Up. Black Up, yeah. And he saw that online and reached out to me and said, you know, um, <laughs> he actually sent me a 30 second clip off his then uh, forthcoming album, which was the 30 second Erica Badu <coughs> opening for yeah. which became Until the Quiet Comes. And I remember being so excited that I could do something 30 seconds for him. And I listened to that 30 second clip for seven months. And I was like, I'm gonna, you know, it, you know, it's a, if you listen to this that moment, it's really there's a lot going it's on. Dense, yeah. Yeah, and then somehow they decided, uh, you know, to give me a little more room to <coughs> make stuff. So. And how did um, Storyboard P kind of? Actually, AJ Arthur Jaffa, who's a. Good this is a very good moment, you guys. It's not a maybe. It's an actual. We've got <laughs> our special guest here. So now we're going to make it a trio. So if I budge over, um, Arthur J. for letters and gentlemen. What's up, guys? <laughs> so I should say, I was going to save this question for later, but I think this is a good point. Another kind of informal conversation that we'd had, you mentioned yourself, and Malik Saeed and AJ as kind of train bird and miles. Did I say that? Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> what was that? Yeah. That's cool. I, didn't, I don't. That's well, okay. <laughs> See? Ah, oh, you gotta give me something here. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna ask you to say some more about that, but. I mean, it's if I did say that, and it's it's if you have written, you know. Uh, <laughs> Um, yes, I've that. written it, so now it's true. Um, I mean, it's the, you know, the obvious kind of lineage. I mean, we're, Malik and I both, uh, I'm, not, I'm speaking from Malik based on conversations I had, like when we met AJ, it just changed everything about, um, you know, there's no real North Star for black filmmakers. Uh, and he was the first time I was like, and I, from what I've learned about, uh, did I say train? Oh, okay, but um, <laughs> for Miles, when he, uh, specifically uh, when he met Charlie Parker, it was like North Star kind of thing. Um, That's what you said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was maybe what I was referring to. Did I ever say that to you? Uh, I don't know. I don't <laughs> Have you ever thought of it like that? No. I mean, it's a. Uh, it's a slightly immodest thing. Slightly immodest thing to say. Immodest. Oh, immodest. That's exactly. That's why I, mean, exactly. I don't remember. I don't remember. I mean, that's something somebody is supposed to say about you. You're not necessarily supposed to say it about yourself. 
That's what, that's what I'm saying. I, I, know, I don't. It was, it was a quiet. It was, it was the end I don't of a remember conversation. Saying that. I really don't remember. Saying that. But <laughs> I mean, I mean, to I mean, me, it's it's just more like it's just an instance in which you had three super creative people occupying the same kind of footprint. And I don't think anybody's creativity diminishes anybody else's. They're their own universes. And, um, you know, oftentimes we work with these models, yeah, ego models that I don't think necessarily equate for black folks. That's, I mean, that's my feeling about it. Because people say, control your ego. Keep your ego in the check. But, like, Wu-Tang, hip-hop in general, nobody's keeping their egos <laughs> in the check. You know, but it doesn't also mean like when was the last time you saw a hip hop record that just had one person rap on rapping on it? So the kind of normal formulation of ego means people can't work together doesn't really hold in hip hop or jazz. Or jazz. So that's kind of what, really what it's about. Well, that. Um, but to, get, to answer your question, he actually exposed me to Storyboard P. He was showing me clips of his back in 2011 or 2012. Yeah. He was obsessed as he has these kind of amazing obsessions <laughs> of things he finds online. And I remember seeing this guy, and um, I don't think he had any plans to, you know, I don't know, did you have plans to work with I mean, you just worked no, with him. Oh, it was just amazing. It was just yeah. amazing shit. Exactly. Know, so. Is um, that also how you came to work with Okwasili? Because it was amazing? No, yeah, <laughs> but the Nigerian dance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you guys know Arthur Javis work? He has a show right now at the Serpentine. And I think a lot of people will see it. Well, one of the, another question I had, and it's a question that I think really holds for both of you, is how you manage to straddle the kind of the art world increasingly. I mean, I've seen each of those works in art museum contexts, mm -hmm. um, Black Up and Until the Quiet Comes in an exhibition that Kara Walker curated, so another artist who curated an exhibition called Roughneck Constructivist that I saw at ICA Philadelphia. Um, you know, AJ's got his exhibition on right now, but has had his work shown in other places as well. And so I'm interested in how you straddle um, the art world and the, the film world, you know, kind mm. of working on commissions, but then showing these moving image works as artworks. Um, well, it's interesting enough, uh, when Kara Walker reached out, it was, I didn't understand exactly, I had never, you know, shown my work in that context, so she was curating a show called Roughneck Constructivist, and, um, I actually understand that she got that title from AJ. Really? She, I remember she gave an opening address at the ICA, and it wasn't surprising because it seemed, you know, it, it seemed like something that, you know, AJ a meant. Apache together with she, she put oh, She also put him in the Love show. She, AJ was also in the show, um, which is, you know, which is really interesting. Cut to now, you know, we actually yeah. both have. Still together. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how I, how I stra straddle it uh, personally. I just kind of take, take it one step at a time. He's a, he has like a big gallerist and so he has a big, I haven't done that whole thing yet, so maybe he can, it's, he's been straddling the world a, a lot. The straddler. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you find it, kind of moving between the two? Um, I don't, I, am I moving between yeah, the two? Yeah. <laughs> More than me, I, 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 would, know. I would argue. I don't know. I mean, I mean, my art career, such as it is, is about seven months old. Eight, 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 eight. I mean, like literally. I know. Of. <laughs> so um, I don't know. I mean, the moving between the two. Yeah. I mean, it's like you know, you get invited to do something, you do it or you don't. Yeah. But yeah. then there are other spaces as well because you know the underground museum, mm -hmm. and I think let's let's talk about the underground museum. Mm -hmm. I don't know if everyone here knows even what it is. Would you like um, to say a little bit about it? You can probably see uh, Underground music? Yeah. yeah. Speak about because that's a space that has been created specifically for its location, for the community, and of course you're kind of stitched into the fabric of it, but you know, you are as well in many ways. Well, I mean, my, my sort of introduction to the Underground Museum, of course, is through Noah, because it was really Noah's vision. 
And the very first time I heard Noah mention it, it sounded crazy to me, frankly. Mm -hmm. Because he was talking about it at one point being a speakeasy. It was like all kinds of stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was like, ah, you should show art and drink some liquor. And yeah. All in the same footprint. And anybody who knows LA, LA is a strange place with regards to black folks, I think, right? Because it's got this, on one hand, concentration of blackness that most people would identify around South Central, Compton, you know, uh, gangster rap, gang bang. It's like, oh, this kind of one little note that people associate. But if you're in LA itself, black folks to me, and I, and I understand as a person who, I live there now, but I didn't, certainly I grew up in Mississippi, so it couldn't be farther away, but um, supposedly black folks' presence is sort of dispersed now, dissipated. I mean, as a sense that the black community is uh, being evacuated a yeah. little bit, you know. So, uh, so I think when Noah first mentioned to me, when he first mentioned the idea to me, and also Chris, I guess, was talking about it. Uh, Chris Gibbs, a really good friend of ours, and really good friend of Noah's. Uh, it, it definitely had the oasis. I mean, the oasis thing was part of it. I think like this could be. Yeah. A kind of repository, a place where folks could uh, hang out and work could be uh, presented in a way that was sensitive to the cultural aspects of it. So, But it was definitely a very visionary thing because like, to see it now, it's not really... It's crazy. He definitely was seeing some shit nobody else could see because everybody was like, you know, his career as a painter was just off the hook and he was making crazy amount of work. Yeah. We had, we were sharing a, a space in the studio out in East LA. So when he started talking about he wanted to open this museum on Washington Boulevard, it just sounded, and he was going to serve alcohol and have a bar and anything. Just, I was like, why doesn't Noah just focus on his art? Why is he trying to be like a I saloon, know. run a saloon? I don't so quite understand. <laughs> but when you see it now, when you saw it, you know, even before Noah passed, it had like you could see it like what it was. It was like really amazing. It was like incredible visionary kind of leap, you know. So um I wonder if we should take some questions from the audience. Sure. Oh, somebody's got their hand up right there. Um, my colleague Louisa, who's there with the mic, I think if we can, because we're recording it, if you don't mind waiting. So this gentleman in the white shirt right there. Thank you. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry, just there, hand up. <laughs> so could you... Could you talk about um, what matters most? What, what is that? What's your association with it? Um, hmm. That's the first okay. thing I kind of heard about you through the Save George video. Um, that was a collective that uh, became a company and then uh, dissolved. Sure. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> See, you guys, I'm doing great up here <laughs> in the denim jacket. Do you speak, Arthur J. For a couple of weeks ago at Serpentine when you talked a lot about the relationship between music and film and how you try and create films that look like what music sounds like? So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about. Music in Khalil Joseph's work. Music in his work? <laughs> um, I mean, like the music thing for me, when I talk about it in relationship to film, it's really about how music is functioning as, I think, I think for all of us, I try to speak for everybody, but as a kind of paradigm, you know, like, okay, this is what it could be. It's not necessarily, per se, to imitate the music, per se, but the whole idea is, like, clearly music is this space where black folks are very actualized. Um, and this whole question of actualization is a central component of black being or just the existential nature of being black, period. 
is to what degree will you fully or not fully actualize? And of course, all human beings deal with that. But for us, it's a very pronounced thing because there are all these structures that sort of get in the way of you being fully actualized. So for every Usain Bolt or Pele or Michael Jordan in our context, you know, there's, if you say, oh, Michael Jordan is great, most black folks will say, yeah, but so-and-so, Johnny, so-and-so who lived down on the corner would have crushed him, yeah, would have destroyed him, you know? And I grew up hearing those kinds of narratives about almost any great athlete, my dad would tell me somebody, oh, yeah, he was fast, but I remember one time so-and-so ran past him on the way to the grocery <laughs> store. So is this, there's this thing circling around sort of interrupted actualization of potentiality, right? So the music thing is a good paradigm because it's probably the only space in which we could honestly, collectively say we've done our thing. And we think we've done our thing and everybody else thinks we've done our thing. So when it comes to thinking about cinema, which is a space in which to a large degree we are not very actualized because it's mostly because it's super capital intensive. Uh, so that even if you get a budget, there's so much at stake that there's no space to play. So the music really ends up being, like I say, a kind of, like you said, North Star. It's like a paradigm of what, what could be possible. And so it's not just the form itself. So it's not just imitating the form. It's like understanding things like black sociality is at the core of black music making. It doesn't matter Brazil, Jamaica, anyway. It's always this social dimension. So. You start thinking about cinema, the first thing you start asking yourself is like, well, how does the sociality start to bring itself to bear? So like, that's why this whole thing of, uh, you know, that was a collective or trained miles and, it could be trained miles and bird yeah. or trained miles and monk. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's just always these triads in a sense, inside of triads, inside of triads. So, I think like in Khalil's work, I mean, I was thinking earlier, like I had never seen that version of Wildcat. Yeah, this took, I just, uh, And I've seen it a thousand times, so I'm sitting there like, yeah. <laughs> I've never seen that shot before, you know, cause I have my favorite parts. But uh, it made me think about like how there are continuities of things that people do that don't necessarily get attributed. It's like secret histories, like for example, like the thing that Khalil has done has completely masked it. He is the best at it, is breaking the music up sure. and just reformulating the music as a structure for his visual palette, right? But the first person I, I ever saw do that was Spike Lee in a Miles Davis video. I never forgot it. It's a, it was from Tutu, maybe? Hmm. It was either Tutu, it was one of his, you know, in the 80s. He had this video where he cut three different songs. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was like a medley. And you know, of course, there's no lyrics, so it's slightly different, but it was a medley. And I remember sitting looking at it thinking, like, whoa, what was that? That was like a real innovative thing that he did that I don't even know if Khalil necessarily saw that, but it doesn't matter whether he saw it or not, because I think so many of these things are like, as Marie said, they just grew. Like, who invented that? Just grew invented that, meaning the shit just mm -hmm. happened, but it's because there's some sort of, almost like a neural net or something, you know? And then these things get picked up. I'll give you another great one. Say, for example, um, like in Hype, Hype Williams' work, we'll talk about super important motion picture innovator, right? So, like, everybody knows that. What's the one, the Bustle Rhymes video? Uh -huh. Put your hands on my Put your hands, show. yeah, you know. That was the one that was, like, of anything I think he ever did was Watch the most it. startling thing. Yeah. And it was, some of it was the content, but mostly it wasn't the content, it was just the way people were moving. And that was a period where for a year and a half, every video was yeah. like that, right yeah. to the shit. Just, oh man, do we have to see another video where everybody's moving like this, right? <laughs> but the thing is, is like, Hype was very onto something around this motion thing that was really, really deep. And now this, now this is the secret history part of it. Steven Spielberg, like what does Steven Spielberg have to do with Hype Williams, right? Okay, he made, in my opinion, the greatest action sequence, maybe in the history of cinema. 
certainly in the latter half of the 20th century. And that's in Saving Private Ryan. The B sequence, when they come in, and you know, it's crazy the way it's jittery and all that kind of stuff. Okay, hype is responsible for that. I'm gonna tell you how it happened. <laughs> he did a job, and he always, he, his primary collaborator was Malik Saeed. Like that was his, they were a unit. When I first I met Malik, I met Hype through Malik. They came to visit the set of Crooklyn, I remember. Like, and they were just, Saeed was an art director, they were both working for Lionel Martin, mm -hmm. who was the first black music video director who had a career, so to speak, right? So Hype would occasionally work with people who he thought was interesting. So he did a job with Jonas. No way. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. Spielberg cinematographer. Wow. And on this video, Hype was fucking with the shutter thing. <laughs> no, for real. I can't make this shit up. And, and basically, Spielberg was prepping Private Ryan, and Jonas Koninsky took the Hype thing he was doing and presented to Spielberg, said, hey, we, I think we should shoot that opening sequence like this. Now, not to take anything away from Spielberg, it's a dope sequence and all that kind of stuff. Like, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, that's an instance where a person who has resources is able to fully actualize the thing, whereas a person who doesn't necessarily have those kind of resources, it's kind of, it's narrow, like you have to, track what has happened. Like hype, to me, it's a big tragedy that hype only made one feature film, which is an incredible visionary feature film. It's not perfect, but it's, you know. So anyway, that's for example. Is there another question? Are you guys shy? Well, picking up on that, I was thinking also that same, Hilton Ulls said this five years ago, but he referred to your way of making music videos as a kind of visual riff on the music. So it wasn't about kind of literally kind of illustrating the music, but that visual riffing is very much kind of in keeping well, Yeah, that. it's interesting. There's um, uh, one of the reasons I've been so reluctant to make start making feature films is because a lot of the conversations around making features in the very beginning is it's a very contrived process. Um, you got write scripts and you talk to producers and they got to finance against, you know, and actors get involved and they got to know their motivation and all this kind of shit. And you're kind of like, uh, all the stuff that I've made thus far, I mean, very, I mean, I don't think, you know, it goes past writing ideas down on napkins, you know, like, uh, which you can't really raise a million dollars you know, around some napkin scraps. Um, so what I learned in the music space is that I can actually, there's stuff I'm trying to get at that words are just not enough. You know, I don't care what the character says, I don't care, or, you know, what the action is. It's just, I've been able to do things, even the storyboard moment and Until the Quiet Comes, I, you know, that to me was a watershed moment in terms of being able to, and my father had just passed away when I made that and I had, you know, didn't know what to do with all that emotionality. Yeah. Um, but I remember I want, how I wanted the thing to feel. And uh, so, you know, it, I felt like that was my therapy until the quiet comes. So um, in general, the space that I'm occupying right now is really interesting because I could, I feel like I'm able to create things that I don't have words for, you know, yeah. so. We're going to go to the back. There's someone with a cap on and arm up. A very long arm. I think it's a very tall person. Um, <clears throat> I just had a question on creative process or creative genesis, so to speak. Uh, I listened to a talk recently with Tanahasi Coates where he was talking about um, the reason why he wrote Between the World and Me. And he talked how he read James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, and it completely blew his world open um, and kind of decided from there that he needed to put more of himself out. And I just wondered if you ever had a sort of Damascus moment, whether it's through literature, through film, or like where there's like a jazz song you heard or anything that just kind of like really just your world was never the same after that experience. Yeah, countless times, I mean. Um, 
Yeah, it happens to, to, to this day. I remember seeing um, Tarkovsky's The Mirror when I was like 19. And I just, I, you know, it's such an astounding experience for someone who's just has no reference on what, you know, his syntax is or what he's trying to, there's, I was just like, but it's so, the, um, what I felt was so palpable and I just didn't have words to try to, you know, and I remember the professor had given no preface to like, I think it was a cinematography class. He was like, this is some stuff you could do with a camera. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what the fuck is this? Wow. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, it, that was a moment for sure. And I still, to this day, I think he's one of the best. I think if there was room for filmmakers then to occupy an art space, he would have absolutely, uh, you know. Major reference point for Jana Comfort, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah, for sure. What about you? I'm sure you had a 2001 it's, it's my, what? moment. Yeah, 2001. But Tarkovsky is my favorite filmmaker. In the mirror is his best film. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's best, most visionary film. Yeah. Advanced film. Exactly. Yeah, just uh, just quickly, though, this whole thing, like, you said it, the same thing. It's like, it's not one moment. Like, for me, the Damascus moment, it's not, it's like, black culture is just yeah. relentless. Yeah. It just does not stop. On the corner, like on the street, yeah. It goes off for a second, you wake up in the front of some yeah. truly amazing Amazing shit, you know. Yeah. Like I, I just took a trip to Italy with my mom and my son, and I came back from it. And I was telling the friend, I'm feeling really ambitious, man, because that that Michelangelo's uh, Pieta was that was that was kind of dope. I like that a lot, you know. And they say, yeah, but don't you think that's a little? I don't know, man. That's I don't know. That's that seems like that's I don't know. Comparing yourself to Michelangelo, I was like. Well, look, he didn't even have the benefit of hearing Jimi Hendrix or John Coltrane. <laughs> so, so, just as, for example, in terms of the masculines, you know, or Public Enemy, or Kendrick Lamar, you know, so I'm already like a zillion years ahead of it. <laughs> so. It's true. Um, I just wanted to know, um, I went to the 180 Strand um, at the end of last year, and I saw infinite Mad City. Mix. Yeah, the Infinite Mix, thanks. And I saw Mad City there. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering when I saw certain s symbolism that you put into it, such as the baby um, calling across the alphabet that mm. had the sign language going through it. And also near you had the guy hanging up from the um, lamppost. And mm. I was, yeah, as like a sort of like a ghetto vampire as, as such. And I was just wondering, is there a specific process that you go through in like creating your sort of modern symbolism that reflects also like the environment that you're trying to um, sort of capture? Um, I'm sure my process is very similar to every, you know, anybody, any creative person's process, which is uh, you're attracted to things and ideas that match up with, you know, what, what you're trying to do, essentially. So, um, yeah, I've never actually thought too deep about my process, to be honest. Um, but um, maybe for that project, that project happened so fast. <coughs> I do remember that. I remember I got a call from the, that camp and he had just been asked to go on t tour, his very first tour ever. And he, Kanye had asked him to open up for him. And this is when Kanye was like, the, he had the most uh, elaborate kind of, he was hiring fine artists, Vanessa Beecroft, to create these incredible kind of sets. And here's Kendrick, all of 24 years old, in Compton, from Compton, never graduated high school, and he had like four weeks to like figure out how to captivate an audience. You know, he's only been in the booth. He's never even like, had a real, he's never been on tour. So he called me and said, hey, um, I really would love for you to like creative direct or art direct my concert tour. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm now competing with Vanessa Beecroft and Kanye. He kind of put that on me. <laughs> I was like, I just wanted to, at the time I really wanted to work with Kendrick, that album was really important to me. You know, being in California, listening to it was just amazing. Um, 
And I had no idea what I wanted to do. I do remember that, like zero idea. I was like, I know I should probably shoot in Compton. And that's about all I, and I just dove in. Um, you know, everybody has their own sets of references and kind of stuff that they, you know, get into when they're uh, creating. And uh, I remember seeing all the street lights when I was in Compton. So I was like, oh, it'd be interesting to do something with the street lights. Like, you know, what could I do? Like tie lights, you know, you just kind of go through it. And it's like, I wonder if I could hang somebody from a light post. And I, my wife was my producer. She was like, uh, <laughs> you mean like in post? I was like, no, I really want to have somebody up there. And so it's just a process. You start talking to uh, stunt guys who work on like, you know, Mission Impossible and stuff, and they tell you what their take is, and you talk to, you know, and then you kind of figure out, you kind of go from there. And you're like, oh, it's actually not that, you know, it's like some wire removal. <laughs> That's it. Let's do it. And what about Du Bois? Because that's actually the two channel version. So the version that was shown. An oh, infinite mix is called double consciousness. Well, so it's, it's not actually the same. called Mad, but when oh. it was at Mocha, they had asked to have a title for the show. Okay. And so that's where that came. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of a, yeah. Yes. There was a question down front. Hi. Um, I was going to ask a similar question to that gentleman, but I think following on, so this kind of grace, you know, this kind of instinctive way of working, finding inspiration where you can, what then happens in the edit? Going back to AJ's point about the relationship between what you do with music and the image, is the editing process quite similar? Is there a kind of an organic, or is that where you're shaping the narrative? Is that more structured? How, how do you manage that? Yeah, I was um, super fortunate early in my development to really learn how to edit. Um, a, I just took to it, which was, which was great. But then as I got a little older, um, I realized like that's when the shit happens, you know? like. Uh, yeah, and no one's gonna sit there longer than I would. I, I didn't have enough money to pay anybody to sit there and focus on a scene for as long as I would. So um, I became an, like a master editor of my own world of editing. You know, like if someone had asked me to edit for them, even like on a small job, I probably would have fucked it up just because, you know, I'm trying to facilitate someone else's vision. And uh, but I knew how to kind of like just really hone in on my little in idiosyncratic way of um, working. And then um, it just made it a lot easier for me to talk to another editor because I already knew the, you know, the lingo and the tools and how to, and so as my projects kind of grew in scope, I would work with other edit editors, I guess. And um, they kind of had to learn how to understand my, because there's no script, there's no like, okay, so what's this thing about? I'm like, I don't know, let's figure it out. And they're like, whoa, like that's, you know, you got 17 hours of footage, man. Like I said, it's a lot of figuring out. Like Wildcat, I mean, he'll tell you, we spent forever. <laughs> we, I, mean, I spent a long, not nine months or something. It's a yeah. seven minute I piece. I can tell the Wildcat story. <laughs> uh, they got to however long it took, nine months or whatever it was. And the producer, uh, I think they had done a color correction. Malik had done a final color. Because, you know, it was shot with for red, right? Shot with the red, yeah. So it's, you know, it captures everything in color, but it had been color corrected in black and white. And it's like two or three o'clock in the morning, like literally. And this is like, I don't know, must be like four or five months past the deadline. And the producer's standing there like, oh, we just, you know, we got to get this thing in, right? And I walked in, Khalil's like, yo, Jay, hey, man, look at this. What do you think? Uh, should we maybe do it in color? <laughs> so he's sitting there looking at the shot, that shot with the it stuff was burning. Beautiful too, right? It was beautiful. It was, it was really beautiful. And he was like, what do you think of this, man? I was like, super beautiful. And this producer's behind me going like, 
Like, no, 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 don't say that. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's beautiful, but I think you, I think you nailed it, brother. I think it's like, I think you got it. I think you got it. I've never heard that story. <laughs> it's so mean. I've never heard that. Story. Yeah, that's funny. There's one. I have a jacket in my bag. I'm freezing. I know it's super cold. It's Sorry, we're up here shivering. <laughs> Maybe since I've said that, maybe they'll turn the air con off. Hey, uh, hey, well, hey, hello. Firstly, um, thank you for blessing the world with those amazing visuals. Oh, thank you. Man. Um, and my question has, I guess it's kind of been answered a little bit already or been spoken about anyway and riffs off of that. It's about dialogue or the lack thereof that you've kind of mastered throughout your work. Um, how, like, what is the biggest challenge of, you know, punctuating a piece of visual, a visual story without words? Um, I've found that I'm interested in authenticity, period. That's, um, I think I've had this conversation with AJ, actually. Um, which is not surprising to me that I've worked with musicians because they're actually, they're authentic. You know, when you meet Kendrick, it matches up with who he is on CD and stuff. Actors are entirely fake. Everything they do is fake. So when you meet, fill in the blank, it's not what the film that you're, the art that they make is not who they are. Um, and I, that struck me recently, actually, when I was thinking, I've been you know, meeting actors and stuff, wanting to make certain things. And um, it's like you have this idea of a, somebody in your head, a character, let's say, and then you meet these people and they, they are, you know, it's just this process, it's all fake. Um, but I noticed that body language is, you can't fake body language, you know? Um, and so I became increasingly interested in just people's body language and gestures, especially black folks, you know? Like you travel anywhere, Brazil, Africa, the way they lean and walk, and it's just way more eloquent than anything, not anything they could say, but it's more eloquent than a lot of the stuff. The I, words I can put in their mouth to try to, you see what I'm saying? So. Um, when you kind of, I don't want to say confuse people or confuse them, but when you just kind of get them out of their head and like, hey, move here, do this, think about that. They're just kind of moving around. And I've worked with uh, my cinematographers now enough where they understand the process. So um, that for me is my language. Like, I've also learned, you know, uh, words are just this, uh, so limited. <laughs> You know, I mean, there's some master wordsmiths, um, but uh, uh, you know, jazz doesn't have any language. You know, I think, uh, you know, words, uh, lyrics and stuff like that. So classical music, you know, there's stuff from 300 years ago that's just like making cry, you know? Um, so, yeah. I mean, can I, um, so this is one of those things where we agree, but we also don't agree. <laughs> Um, Cause I think I mean I always just say Kendrick. I mean he couldn't be more of a master wordsmith. What he does with language there, um, and then a lot of the best hip hop is shit where one person wrote it and somebody else yeah. actually performed it. Even though it's the dark secret of hip hop <laughs> and Drake around here somewhere. Oh. <laughs> but I mean not just him. I'm just saying. You know? <laughs> um, and that, like, for my, I know I agree with exactly what you're saying in terms of, like, the actorly process is built on pretense. That would be a more polite way of saying it than <laughs> say it's fake. Um, but the thing is, is like, but I think we're in full agreement. It's like, but what we're really trying to get at is authenticity. How do you get something that feels authentic? So... To me, like everything, it's just a challenge. It's just like fig figuring out how to do it because like he said, he's writing his ideas on a napkin. I completely get that, you know, for real. But, you know, it's like, again, it's always, like I used to say, like the one, it's like the upside of underdevelopment is that we shouldn't be invested in legacy systems. Meaning, because our shit is so underdeveloped, we could basically do it however we want to do it. We can invent it or we can also adopt what other people are doing. Like, I, like, to me, the best example of a person whose relationship, who actually uses actors and they have words and all this kind of stuff, 
but their relationship to the script is a radically different relationship to the script than classical would be like Michael Lee. Mm -hmm. You know, basically he starts off like with an idea on an app, and he mm -hmm. actually starts off narrative. Sometimes he doesn't even have an idea on an app, and he just has, this is my budget. <laughs> I got $1,000, as he said, I have $1,000, which means I can either pay 1,000 people $1 or one person $1,000. That's where he starts. And he gets somebody in the room, and they start having conversations and stuff. And, they, and, and he says, OK, make a list of everybody you could conceivably pay based on your age, your age range and gender. And they, most people, he said, would write, tap out about 200, maybe 250 people. And then he goes through that list and they talk about everybody on the list. And then he scratches some people off, leaves some people on, and then he sends them out to get more research on those people and then finally gets narrowed down by three or four people. And that's the beginning of a character. Before you even have the narrative or anything, you just got a character. And he's doing that with however many people he could afford to do it with. And then they start interacting together. So that's a different way. So like for me, I'm interested in that as a way for us to get an authenticity that can actually bring language into it. But the other thing, too, is this. The language doesn't have to be tethered to what we see people yeah. doing, which is something I'm also really interested in, just have people like treat it like, like, you know, Terrence Malick does it. He just has voices going over the top of it. Like in Day of Heaven, you have uh, yeah. Linda Manz's voice is just going. So that just seems to me like a place where black folks could really get their swerve on. <laughs> and also, like I don't, I just, um, I'm learning how it's it's also kind of a learning process for me. Like as I'm realizing, I want to grow into making films. Um, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm still, you know, I, I write a lot, but um, yeah, uh, one day I'll probably, you know, I'll get to the moment where I'm work, be able to work with trained actors. That's the thing. I, uh, me getting in the room with a Denzel Washington, let's say, who's actually a great actor. Me bringing my style at this at the stages I've been is just it's too. He's too big of a instrument for my talent quite yet. See what I'm saying? So at one point, I fully intend to get to a place where I can bring everything I've learned plus you know the thing that they do really well. Um, you know, start working with writers and stuff to help me think through these kinds of things as well. So it's a maturity thing on my part, I think, personally. But yeah. There's a hand in the back, if that's okay. And we might let that be the last one before Mark oh, okay. gives us a little decorava okay. interlude. For sure. Yeah, and then we'll come back after okay. the other. Um, so I was just wondering, on that note, how do you choose what more commercial work you do, such as the work for Kenzo? Um, that too is organic. Like I don't, I don't care. You know, personally, I don't really care for Kenzo. I'll be honest. I didn't even know who they were when they called. But um, I met the people, you know, that designed for them and worked for them, and they were just, they made me confident that they were truly interested in the stuff I was making and wanted to truly collaborate. Um, it's one of those grace moments. I literally remember getting the phone call, or you know, the email or whatever, and I turned to my wife, I was like, what the hell is Kenzo? <laughs> and she was like, that is Kenzo? I love Kenzo. So <laughs> my wife is really the reason I even, I was like, all right, you like, you know, should I? She's like, yeah. And I ended up talking to art directors, and they're, to this day, some of my very close friends. So. You know, if there were, had been different people who engaged me at Kenzo, I clearly would have, you know, kept it moving. But that's generally how it works. Okay. I think what we're going to do, we can, we're going to take our seats. We're going to step off the stage. And my colleague, Mark Godfrey, has got some kind of contextual notes for us about Roy Decarava before we see the main event. 
So, um, yeah, I know we're all excited to see the premiere of Khalil's new film, uh, and I wanted just to link it back to the exhibition Soul of a Nation Art in the Age of Black Power. Um, some of you will have seen it and will know uh, how important Roy de Carava is within it. Some of you haven't seen it yet, so that's why I'm uh, telling you a, a bit about it. From the beginning of Zoe and my conversations about this show, we always knew it would be a show about strong artistic voices, strong artistic communities. And um, so when we thought about the role of photography in the show, we didn't really want to go down the route of documentary practices uh, or, you know, um, commissioned photography. And it became very clear to us quite quickly that the preeminent figure was Roy de Carava, and we should really focus on him. And so in the room devoted to photography, there's a wall of his photographs from the period covered by the show, facing a wall by the Kamoingi group, and he was the first director of that group. It was a group of younger African-American photographers based in New York. Um, and he was also connected to many of the other artists in the show. He photographed Norman Lewis, whose works in the first room, but he was a student of Charles White, who you see in the room just before you see Roy de Carava's work. Charles White, of course, also the teacher of David Hammonds, Kerry James Marshall, and many, many others. Um, of course, he was, you know, the, 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 the political circumstances around him were really critical to Roy de Carava's thinking, but he didn't choose to make images of the main event. So the bottom left corner is the photograph he made at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. He doesn't photograph uh, Martin Luther King on the podium. He photographs one of the, one of the, the marches over there. The top uh, right photograph, and I'm terrible with left and right, is a photograph called Five Men, New York, 1964. And it's an image of five men leaving a memorial service in New York following a memorial for the, after the, the killing of four girls in Birmingham, Alabama at the end of 1963. So he looks at politics through, um, through figures as much as he photographs Malcolm X. Uh, he's, of course, like Khalil, I think, um, you know, extremely connected to the most incredible musicians of his moment. Sometimes unnamed, like the late night, sing, late night uh, singer with Mike, that's top left. But of course, you've got uh, John Coltrane, and then going clockwise, Elvin Jones, who was probably playing in the John Coltrane Quartet at this point, and Ornette Coleman. And, and, you know, he would visit the clubs. And later on in his life, finally, he got to publish a book called The Sound I Saw, which he designed and, and sadly didn't ever get widely released. But that aspect of his, of his practice was really crucial. But we also wanted to throw attention onto his work with abstraction, much less well known than his images of people like Malcolm X or Coltrane. And in this way, connect him to the subject of abstraction that's very prominent in the show through many artists from Sam Gilliam to David Hammonds, Alma Thomas, and so on, but a particular way of working with abstraction within photography. Um, most important, really, de Carava was a master craftsman who printed all his own images. And what was so innovative in his practice was what he did with dark tonalities. Um, some, I mean, of course, you can't see this in a PowerPoint pr presentation of his work. When you're in front of the works, you really have to linger to make out the differences between different areas to actually work out what it is. And he talks in his interviews about wanting to slow you down until the point where you're really uh, trying to distinguish one area of the photograph from another. And it's that um, exploration of black tonalities, which is why people began to talk about him as the first artist really working with a black aesthetic in photography. But what's also crucial in the last group of uh, photographs we have in the show is his dedication to photographing black communities in Harlem, sometimes Washington, D.C., sometimes in Bed-Stuy and Brooklyn. And this is a quote from 1972, which is bang in the middle of our exhibition in uh, a, a little-known um, uh, interview that he gave for Black Creation, where he says, I wanted to photograph black people simply because I felt it was ridiculous that nobody was doing it. The only people who were attempting it were white photographers, and they were doing it from an exotic or a social sense. I just had this overwhelming urge to say something honest and positive about poor black people in the city. Because I was poor, and as far as I was concerned, I was, I was them too. The only difference was that perhaps I had survived enough to be able to do something that they weren't able to do. 
So um, Tukarava became, you know, incredibly important for our research. And um, at the time, these were the ways in which his work was distributed. Very famously, before the period of our show, he uh, made a book with Langston Hughes, The Sweet Fly Paper of Life. He was included in the Studio Museum program in its very first year in an exhibition called Through Black Eyes. There was a show in 1970, Roy de Crava, photographer. What we discovered in our research is that he also contributed to a publication called The Liberator um, with a small picture essay. This is hardly known about. Um, we uh, went to see... I spent quite some time with Sherry and Wendy to de Carava in the archives in Brooklyn. And when we had the opportunity from the Ford Foundation to commission uh, artists, um, Zoe spoke to Khalil and we said, um, we would like to invite you to choose any artist, any of the 64 artists in Soul of a Nation and to make a new work based on them. And I think it took about an, an hour, maybe less, before it came, became clear that he wanted to make a film about or coming out of his own interest in Roy de Carava. So we put him in touch with uh, Wendy and Sherry, and um, the work you're about to see comes out of those conversations. But a, an interest, I'm sure, in the work that w goes way, way back uh, and much before we were thinking about this exhibition. We haven't seen the film, um, but we know it's called uh, Black Mary, and we're very, very excited. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. No, you, you guys have the right idea. We need one of those up here. Um, oh, the ankles. Me too. Well, maybe I'll talk a little bit about why, how. Like, so, um, um, I've been influenced by Roy Rava's work since before, you know, since everything I've ever made. So um, that's why it was so easy for me to, uh, when we had the conversation. But when I was talking to Sherry, Dick Rava's widow, um, you know, she illuminated a lot of stuff I just never knew. And one of the things she talked about, which really struck me, was his obsession might be a bit of, uh, you know, may not be the accurate word, but he was really um, connected to Billie Holiday. And he knew her, took a lot of amazing portraits of her. Um, and she actually played me a lot of, his record collection is in perfect mint condition. He died in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. 2009. Um, and they haven't touched his dark room, they haven't touched his record collection. And so they played me some of his re records that he loved of hers. Um, which was really powerful because I know of Billie Holiday, I know her music, but it was different hearing it in that context in his house on his record player. Um, and apparently as she, her condition deteriorated from, uh, you know, it really, uh, you know, saddened him. Um, and so I have a particular obsession with Alice Smith. Um, a, a lot of people do. Yeah. <laughs> She's amazing, but... Um, uh, you know, obviously, she's a lot, you know, she's healthy. She's, yeah. she's, she's very much uh, present. Uh, but she's not famous. Mm. Um, and it do, there is this tension I have, and I'm sure a lot of people who are big fans of hers, um, when she sings, especially live, it's, you know, she, she, she goes places very few people I've ever seen live. It kind of creates so... I called her when we were filming, and she's based in LA, and we were shooting in New York, and of course, she happened to be in New York, and was willing to kind of like, just show up for a couple days with no you know, money or, um, and I, I, I caught this moment, and uh, it was very clear to me that, you know, when you talk about soul of a nation, you know, we talk about music a lot uh, today and in general, and talk about black culture, but, you know, we're cataloged, I think, culturally in our music. You know, definitely in our art, visual art, but it's our music, which is, you know, arguably our salvation. Mm -hmm. And 
it's not always a political thing for us, for me, and for, you know, for us. But we go through heartbreak, and you know, we lose members of our family. Just that's disconnected from, in a way, this larger socio-political conversation that generally frames us exclusively. Um, so I remember hearing this song, and technically, it's a love song. Um, it's also a cover of a Nina Simone song. That's also a cover, um, and I thought that was really interesting. That I, you know, there's kind of a small evocative um, Billie Holiday black and white stuff. I actually, wasn't really going for it. Mm -hmm. the, the costume designer decided to kind of like do that with the yeah, just kind of go there. Um, and she you knows she has this odd beauty too. You know, she's not classically beautiful. So there was these those elements of De Carava. Um, thing that I was oh, also I called it Black Mary because it was just a title that came to me and it seems it sounds so common in a way it's like Black Jesus or something you know <laughs> but I kind of was going through some research and I couldn't really find much that you know except this one article that came out recently and apparently Black Mary is now being uh, since a lot of stuff that's been going on in the United States in the last few years, they've folded Black Mary as a religious black icon with kind of the patron saint of police violence, which I had no idea of. And, you know, again, there's a lot of pain and soul in her song and her music it has nothing to do with that, te you know, technically, but it's all there. It's all informed in a way by everything, you know, just kind of just cry. It feels like a cry. So that was why I decided I shot a ton of shit. And I kind of whittled it down to this one performance. So, so Oh. Mark has a picture there of shall I? Oh, yeah. We can try and yeah, I love hold that it image. up. That's a it's wonderful really picture. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah it's, it's really beautiful. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Exactly. You, to, you might, if we leave it on the table, then people can come up and see it after. Yeah, I don't want to get on my Frankie Beverly and Mays, but that was actually one of the questions I had written down. I was thinking that there's something in your work also that kind of, kind of consistently combines this kind of joy and pain. <laughs> See, do you like the reference? See, I, I'm not going to sing it now, but I could. So, but I mean, you, you've just spoken about it, but it was mm. something that I also see in the work. I think everybody's probably just processing it, but we've got 15 minutes, so I think if you if you've got questions, you don't have to. You don't have to, <laughs> but I mean, you liberate yourself. There, there are. I can't see. It's oh, there's one. Okay. But I do feel very, it's so great to have you both here. So I just want to thank you both thank you. for your time. I mean, since I'm here and get to sit here, I might just really want to say that. So thank you. And I mean, I always learn so much every time AJ speaks. Time. And then you for a man, a few words. I think we're all like really blessed by everything no. you've had to say tonight. So thank you. Thank you. So whoever's got the mic can speak. <laughs> Sorry, it might not be on. Sure, I, oh, I've got the mic. Um, yeah, it just sort of struck me having the benefit of seeing all four of those films in the span of this short time. That there's just so much intimacy in your films. And I was just wondering, I mean, do you spend time with the people that you're filming? I mean, how do you, how do you manage to get that, that sense, that quality there? I know that you mentioned you don't work with formal actors, but kind of, again, it really came through in that last film, that mm. just the kind of intimacy you can get with the camera, how close you can get. Mm. Um. It's funny you say that because uh, as I was thinking about Roy's work a lot, one of the uh, things that char key characteristics I think single him out more than a lot of photographers that are not super famous is just that his intimacy. I, I was blown away time and again. Um, every image he makes, it just feels really intimate. And um, also, he transcends any easy category of his work. So he's more than a black and white photographer. He's more 
than a jazz photographer. He's more than a street photographer. He's, he kind of transcends all these kind of easy categories that a lot of great photographers, you know, occupy very. Um, but for me, I just work with people I know in order to create that intimacy, you know. Uh, I know Alice. I was fortunate that my wife was good friends with her. Um, I've known her for a while, and I've been wanting to make something with her for a long time, so um, in this case. And then, and in general, my process is pretty low-key, like uh, on sets and stuff, there's a lot of like, quiet on set, rolling, and action, cut. I don't do any of that. So, <laughs> so, you know, people who aren't actors, that kind of shit freaks them out. They freeze up, but if you're, you know, with me, I've learned to just kind of be, uh, be a little more discursive or, you know, relaxed. Uh, generally, I get them doing what they do naturally. So, you know, they don't, I'm not asking them to play Cleopatra or anything. It's kind of like, <laughs> just do you, you know? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm a massive fan. Um, I just wanted to know, like, there's so many people making videos now, and we're always doing treatments for ice, hoping to win the job. And then I was like, always looking at work, and I'm thinking, obviously you're Khalil, so people probably don't ask for treatments. But if you, how would you put that onto paper to like sell it to someone? Do you know what I mean? Like, I do. with the Shabazz stuff and all that sort of stuff. Like that. Yeah. Because the ideas are so mad. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's two. <laughs> There's, there's two, I guess, ways to approach it. Because I've, I've, I've been fortunate to be able to just say, hey, give me some money. You know, I'll figure this thing out. And I've had to kind of heavily talk through and think through, um, you know, what I'm going to do. And my, I get, in the early stages, I would go after artists, Shabazz specifically. Um, I mean, he had like $2,000. So, People can't be very demanding for $2,000. You know? I would suggest finding, um, if it's musicians and bands that you're interested in uh, collaborating with, find, I mean, like you said, there's so much stuff being made that, these days that if you're going after someone, they're generally, they're just really happy that someone's that excited about their music and wants to. You know, I'd suggest I'm going after Kendrick Lamar because, you know, it's just... But, you know, there's a lot of local, regional, kind of amazing... Now, I got lucky Shabazz and Flying Lotus became a little bigger than they were when I first... They were super... I, when I first heard Shabazz's music, it was a mixtape. He wasn't even a thing yet. Um, and I didn't anticipate that he was going to, you know, seven, eight years later, continue to be relevant. So. I, I was fortunate in that in that instance, um, but yeah. And in the beginning, maybe keep your ideas relatively simple. Like one of my earlier projects was just like a one take, you know. Yeah. Oh, so in the back. Sorry. Sorry, the light is really bright. I'm not trying to ignore people. There, there you go. Okay. There we go. Um, hi. Um, I just I find with your work that um, there's a surrealism to the way you depict blackness um, that seems almost ethereal but nevertheless really real and like you said, authentic. Um, and I was wondering when you approach your work, is there a specific way that you want it, you want your subject to be seen or you want I guess blackness in our reality to be seen by your audience? Um, it's interesting, um, I remember, I'll never forget, before I did the Kendrick Lamar project, um, I remember saying very, very clearly to some people I, I still work with, I don't want to do anything cliche. I don't want to do anything ghetto, street, hood, fill in the blank, murder, these kinds of things. I was like, I want to do more interesting, you know, things that I, we don't see. Next call I get is Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> and the next project I could do is Mad, which is arguably the most intense thing I've done in terms of that imagery and that cliche, but I was, um, 
So to answer your question, yes, but also I realize it's the approach. Um, I don't think that word is cliche, though. Yeah, I was, I was fortunate to, if, yeah. Um, uh, think of something that people are, are super familiar with, which is Compton. Um, you know, render it in a more realistic, I'll be honest, when I went out there, I felt like Santa Monica. I was like, this ain't the Compton. I'm, I was expecting. Uh, yeah. That answers your question. I'm okay. There's two people on the stairs. Or there's Lisa, there's a lady on the stairs. Hi. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that you definitely are my North Star. Um, I think it's a good story. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know, you, you use a lot of really interesting soundscapes in your work, and I'm really interested in um, how you actually capture those sounds and what comes first. So in Wildcat, for example, like a lot of the sounds feel like they're paired with the image, but do, they, do you record those beforehand, or are you like recording sounds in the field, or how does that whole work? Yeah, um, in film school they'll teach you like, you know, us up here talking, though, it, it should sound exactly like what, what happened, but immediately it's, it's, it's boring, you know? It's like, <laughs> I, I, I was there, I saw that, it's not that interesting. <laughs> but immediately, I remember being, um, I started playing with, we had this hard drive of sound effects, and the imagery, whatever the exercise was, wasn't that exciting. But I started throwing all this crazy sound at it, and immediately it, it like was the most interesting thing um, I had done in that exercise. I think it was just like a shot of a door, but I had created all this sound, and it, you just didn't know what was happening. And your imagination immediately was trying to figure out what was going on on the other side of the door, you know. Um, and I always talk, we talk about this all the time, like filmmakers, in my opinion, don't ever go as far as they should with sound in terms of the creativity. Um, and that's where I, me and my editors have a really good time with the soundscape. We can really go far. Some of the new work I'm making uh, is really taking it to another level too, which is cool. I'm excited about that. What do you have to say about sound? <laughs> yeah. Sound. Uh, Let me give you the. Let's amplify your sound. There we go. Um, sound. Sound. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I mean, again, I'm. I'm very preoccupied with, like, how do we get at what I would call specifically black modalities. And so, and so one of the things I think that happens is so much of music, so much of what we've done recently in the last couple of years has been in the space of what you'd argue, say music videos and like, I mean, this is like, I think the most interesting stuff by and large has been, the music videos have been more interesting than the movies. Right. Let's put it really bluntly. Um, but one, some of this, there's a technical thing in that that, you know, it goes back to, I'll say, you know, like I was saying, like, um, you know, upside down the development. Okay, the technical part of it is this. Music videos are seldom direct sound. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the history of cinema, the most interesting visual stuff, to me, is the stuff where they don't use direct sound. So that would either be silent films in which somebody just doing a musical accompaniment, right? Or, um, even like Italian films, like Fellini, for example, mm -hmm. none of it's direct sound, it's all sound that poster. Or my favorite is Tati. Like okay. I love Tati, and it's all like poster, like we said, Monsieur Hulot's Holiday. He's riding his bike out to the beach, but it's just all post, it's all Foley, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's like a weird thing, like if you look at Khalil's work or Hype's work or like X1 and Z, like, a lot of what's free about it, the way the images float on top of it, it's just technical. So the thing becomes then when you get in a position to do direct sound, like 
how do we, I mean, I think it's a question, it's an ongoing question, do we give ourselves over to direct sign because that's the way it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, every, most people who know me know I'm obsessed with like hand crank cameras, say for example. If you look at the whole history of silent film, it's super, super visual and the way they normally teach it, it's like it had to be visual because they didn't have sound, right? Mm -hmm. But when, you know, sound comes in, people think like you had these hand crank cameras and then motorized cameras came in and people say, oh man, thank God we got these motorized cameras. We don't have to keep cranking, we can just push the button. You know, and that's not how it was at all. It like, took like 20 something years before motorized cameras displaced hand crank cameras. And the only reason it happened was because sound came in. And when sound came in, the engineer said, in order to achieve perfect sync, we had to have a metronome in the camera. So like right in that moment right there, it's this really interesting thing where I actually don't think black people would ever stop using hand crank cameras. I think just like in Italian films, like they used post dub everything up into the late eighties, the nineties even. It was still post dub and things. So it's like to me the whole question of sound, then it goes, you know, just to sort of what that sister was getting at, it goes back to just like even with Dave Parab, I kept thinking as I was looking at this, like I think Mark was pointing out when he was saying he didn't he shot around the edges of things. So if it was the March of Washington, it wouldn't be King then, it would be a woman and people in the crowd. marching yeah. like that's the kind of to use Fred Mullen's term fugitivity. Mm -hmm. Like black folks never want to like if if it's Arthur Murray with the footprints here going to dance, we will never put our feet <laughs> on the right numbers. Right, we will always be a little ahead, a little behind. It's just something about not wanting to be locked in. I don't know if it's a runaway slave impulse or something. But it's the same thing with sync and sound. It's like not wanting to be locked in. Mm. Somebody gives you a track, you want to break that shit. So you can, you want to make perforated. So it's got holes so you can come in and go out as you. In jazz, that's the whole thing. Like the rhythm is not metronomic. It's fluctuating. So people can jump in and jump out whenever they want to. So I think it's, it all comes down to the same thing at the end of the day. Nice. Brother, I already yeah. asked first. Oh. <laughs> no, no. Uh, <laughs> he got told. <laughs> we'll take a couple more. There's a lady in the back, and then there's one in that direction, because we haven't been to that side of the room. Hi. Um, so I know that in your work, you have, in terms of taking things to the next level and not playing cliches, and also on the sound as well, in terms of your visual work, I know that you've worked with multi screens before mm -hmm. uh, on the internet mix. Um, but are you interested in then taking, uh, looking at things from a sonic, from a 360 point of view? Have you thought about looking at, yeah, taking that to the next level? Um, one thing about the art world that I really enjoy um, is that I was, I, was, I, forget, I was talking about this recently, but um, as a, as a moving image practitioner, let's say, I'm a student of the moving image, I say that a lot. Movies definitely are the MBA of people who make moving images, right? But it's also, movies are very narrow. Like, they generally have to be 90 minutes, single channel, you know, and from there, that's generally the most basic. But for instance, I make a lot of work that's less than 30 minutes uh, and or multi-screen. And I start getting at all this other stuff that I'm trying to explore that generally in film work, uh, and, you know, at least in Hollywood, they're not interested in. Um, but to answer your question, I've been approached by some VR companies recently, and I remember checking out the technology and like moving around and shit like that. It's kind of like that. If you notice, everyone's looking forward. You almost never look behind you unless you hear a loud sound. So to like, it's unnatural to kind of create a 360 experience. I mean, I, there's very few examples actually I could c think of where something is a 360 kind of, you know, where you're, you know, outside of like a basketball game or a football game or something. So I thought about it, but it's, 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 it, 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 it made me more dizzy <laughs> to, you know, think about something. Where 
yeah. at the end of our time. So we're going to take the questions. So someone's got the, there's that lady, somebody with the, yeah. Mark. And the, oh, Mark has a question too. Sorry. Mark has a question. Okay, Mark can, yeah. You can save your question first. Hi, Question, but you mentioned, someone mentioned the cold at the beginning and you, you mentioned your wife and I was just curious as to how important is it you, for you to surround yourself uh, with people you work with and live with that um, allow you to nurture your ideas like to the fullest capacity? Yeah, it's, it's everything. I mean, but anybody will say that. You know, a teacher will tell you that. Like, it's, if you have a good principal, you tend to thrive better, but yeah, I've been very, I've almost headhunted my whole team <laughs> from my assistant to, yeah, from my executive producer to my, the art people in the art world who are around me. It's, it's a very specific group of people. Um, yeah, I mean, I also, in terms of my collaborators on set, though, I do tend to think of them as other musicians in my band. So, you know, sometimes they'll ask me, uh, you know, they want to know a lot about what we're trying to do, and I'll, and I'll kind of be like, <laughs> you know, if you're the bass player, you better, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what each note to hit, like, if you're funky, you're funky, if you're not, I'm going to find another bass player. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it doesn't always work, but a lot of people actually feel freed up to like do their thing, whether they're a production designer, a cinematographer, or actors, you know, it's like, I have something that I'm interested in and you have something that I'm interested in, and so just do that. You trying to please me is you're gonna fail every time, but if you do something that you think is funky, I guarantee you I'm gonna think it's funky, so. It's gonna be, maybe our. Question or an ultimate question? We'll see. Hey, firstly, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, hey, AJ, it's Jen. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted you both, if you could speak a little about, um, it's a bit of an open-ended question, but a bit about um, uh, the frequency of like black life, um, black rhythm, and our understanding as a people of time and how you're kind of intonating this in your work. Is that Jen and Kira? I can speak to the frequency thing. I learned very early that I was destined to be born in Seattle because I'm hypersensitive. And I learned that, I remember the very first time I went to the South and I remember getting off the plane and was just overwhelmed by the amount of, uh, set, you know, history in the ground. <laughs> like, the shit that had transpired there was just everywhere for me. And it was, it, was, it wasn't um, debilitating. It, I just realized how sensitive I was. And in Seattle, you know, the history of slavery in Seattle is, is so small, it's, to, it's almost non-existent. And, uh, you know, I got to grow up in that kind of energetic feel what was pretty relatively liberated from that kind of thing. So the older I got, um, I just realized how sensitive I was. And the more, again, it was very, the, the spectrum of blackness in Seattle was, there's a lot of black people, but it, in terms of the spectrum of how we, you know, inhabit life, which is like all races, we are, we do everything, and you know, from the uh, very professional to superhood. Um, it wasn't until I got older that I get to experience the spectrum, and I start to understand different energetic frequencies that black people inhabit. Uh, I'm not being super articulate, but. Um, I got super interested in that. So when I go to a rodeo in Oklahoma, or if I go to Compton, or if I shoot in Harlem, or if I go to Sierra Leone, you know, or sh where's, where, uh, not, Saf was from, Saf was from, he's, he's not from London, he's from a little, out, a little neighborhood outside London. I already forgot the name. But um, I was able to kind of plug in, you know, basically try to render what I felt specific to that uh, space. 
I grew up in the Mississippi Delta, which is um, intense. Yes, yeah, intense. It's a very intense. I mean, I I I, I definitely characterize it as the uh, the Black Jurassic Park, um, because it's like culturally speaking, it's like live dinosaurs still moving around in the area. It's a very intense place to grow up. I, I I'm a very sensitive person as well. Um, but if you grow up in an environment like that, you have to do something with that. You have to, uh, I know like friends joking at me that I'm not very touchy-feely. So for example, I'm not a super touchy-feely person. So, um, and that's something that has to do with sensitivity, but you know, it's, a, it's kind of a Vulcan mode in a way. Uh, like I know like within the 50 mile radius of where I grew up within 10, 15, maybe even 20 years of when I grew up there, with some of the most horrific violence, everything from Emmett Till to the civil rights workers were killed. You know, that was like all around us, you know? It permeated the space. So, so for me, this whole question of like frequency, I think you said, just, just, just how that stuff permeates your environment. But the Delta, anybody that's been in the Delta too is very interesting because it's also a very emptied out space. It's super flat for one thing. Um, I, I, I know in terms of my own personal upbringing, it was defined by the movement between two distinct spaces, meaning I was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, the home of Elvis Presley, which is Northeast Mississippi, hill country. So in other words, there's no car, no farm, and no nothing like that, dairy, stuff like that more, because there, there wasn't the flat land to do the big agricultural things. But then my parents moved to Clarksdale, which was dead center in the Delta. And Tupelo was the model uh, post-integrated new southern town, not because it was not racist or anything like that, but because they realized integration was going to happen mm -hmm. and they got ahead of it because they realized they were going to benefit if they got ahead of it. Whereas Clarksdale was not that. And these two places were about an hour and a half apart. So pretty much for most of my for most of my early life, on a weekly basis, we drove back and forth between Clarksdale and Tupelo. And it was literally like driving back and forth in time. Clarksdale was a fully segregated environment and Tupelo was integrated. And what it, made, what it did for me in particular, which made me think about this when you were saying what you said about being in different environments, being sensitive, it made me alienated in both places. Because when I was in Tupelo, I was acutely aware of how false this soul racial harmony was. But when I was in Clarksdale, I was acutely aware of how retrograde, you know, segregation was. So I just never kind of like really fit in. And I think that that kind of um, radical alienation, for lack of a better term, is just a, is a center, central thing about just being black in this being a black person in this, like even anybody's heard me talk, no, I, eventually if I talk long enough, I'll get down to talking about African sculptures and white space and how that's a radically alienated artifact. And that radically alienated artifact produces energy. So black people have energy around us just because we are radically alienated. So if you look at the history, can I do this real quick? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just real quick, it's going to be like the abridged version of it, but it goes something like this, <laughs> as, uh, as uh, Biggie might say or something. It goes something like this. Uh, at the turn of the century, at the beginning of the 20th century, African artifacts start to come into the West. Those artifacts come into the West. They've never seen anything like these things. Picasso, Matisse, these people, they see those artifacts, and they realize those artifacts are alien artifacts, and they suggest a different way of seeing the world. I, they suggest these are objects looked at from multiple vantages in space at the same time. Like, so it's not just Western Renaissance perspective. Right. It's here, here, and here all at the same time. Picasso, they see those things, they say, ha, this is dope, the invocation is this, and they make cubism, okay? Straight up, okay. Duchamp, right, who, I, as I've always said, is smarter than anybody else around him. 
He makes his paintings, New Descending the Stairs, which are based on that same basic insight. He makes those paintings, but he got bored with that very quickly because he realized a lot, mostly what he was interested in is how those African artifacts in those white museum spaces were producing this intense energy. It didn't have anything to do with what those things meant like to African people. It had something to do with how radically alienated they were from the context they found themselves in. So he set out to replicate that, and that's how he created the urinal, in my opinion. That's my reading of where the urinal came from. It's a white object that's processing dark shit. Right? <laughs> so so you get these you get these two instances. The first instance is when African artifacts come into the West and completely revamp Western art practice in the 20th century. The second instance is when you now have a domestic African artifact that would be black music in the Americas, particularly jazz in particular, because in this instance, you not only get this radically alienated artifact, but you get the people who produced it standing behind it saying, this matters more than that matters in the process. Whereas in the first instance, you have the artifacts without anybody telling Picasso and them what they meant. But in the second instance, you got people saying, no, that's a great tune, but the tune doesn't matter. What matters is what we did to the tune, how we treated the tune, we improvised on the tune. So you get Pollock and all of them basically just an application of jazz aesthetics, black aesthetic, to the process of painting, right? And I could go on, but that's just to give you a general idea. There's nothing more to say. And as a museum, we're going to rewrite all the labels now. <laughs> no, we're good. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you guys for coming.